Nick です。No. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm extremely pleased to speak because、um, I, you've heard from Zhang Weiwei and from Eric about the development of China. I've been following China from outside very carefully for 40 years. I've been writing about it for 27 years,、uh, and I've now been teaching in China for 10 years. And I see the very positive developments which I expected and which they've explained. And I see in the last 10 years. I want to deal, however, with two experiences, which you can't have. These are the following. I saw not merely the positive development. I mean, I saw with my own eyes, not merely the positive development of China, but the negative development of the collapse of socialism and the restoration of capitalism in Russia. I lived in Moscow for eight years, from 1992 to 2000. So I saw a society decline, and it gives me, therefore, the greatest pleasure to see China rising. That it relates very much to the question of what Zhang Weiwei said about the question of confidence. I, I sometimes can't understand something, which is that people in China are not confident. In my view, China, the danger in China should be arrogance, the view that its achievements are so much bigger than anybody else's. That it doesn't have to pay any attention to anybody else. That's what I think would be the legitimate danger in China. The second thing is because I'm a Westerner, people speak sometimes the truth to me in a way that they won't speak it to you. Often, not very nice truth. But I will tell you some of the things which they say to me, which they will never say to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I'm not going to deal with theoretically. I could give you a big theoretical lecture on economics, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to deal with the question of some personal experiences. Okay, I want to give you a description of Russia when I arrived there in 1991. I went to Russia because I wanted to try to get Russia to follow the Chinese economic reform model, not the, the, not the terrible disaster of the shock therapy which it did. I, I put the situation very simply. At that time. 90% of the population of Russia believed that if they adopted the capitalist system, they would have the American style of living by the end of the year, and that was the pessimists. Some people thought in three weeks we will have American standard living. 90% of the population were crazy pro-U.S. There were English language newspapers, English Russian dual language newspapers, English language radio stations, etc., etc. It was easier for a foreigner to get into a hotel. In Russia, than it was for a Russian to get in. All you had to do was turn up with your foreign passport, and they took you in straight away. When, when I looked at all this, I thought, when the people find out about the truth of what is going to happen, there is going to be a national patriotic explosion. It's going to take place in this country. 28 years later, what is the change? Russia, all the polls show, is one of the most anti-American countries in the world. And support for the memory of the Soviet Union is at a record high. That's what they think. The trouble is they learnt this too late. Right. I want to explain what the disintegration first. That is the negative. What the disintegration of a socialist country means, and what it would mean in the same way for China. I could tell you this theoretically. Putin put it quite rightly that the disintegration of the so Soviet Union. Was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. That's perfectly correct. I could give you an account of the wars which took place in Russia, the war or in the former Soviet Union between Azerbaijan and Armenia, in Chechnya, etc. But I'm not going to talk theory. I'm going to talk about personal experiences. How this I saw this with my own eyes affect the Russian people. First. One of the things I did when I got to Russia, obviously, was to get an office. And when I got this office, I noticed something very strange, which was the, the room of the person who looked after the office building. There was a whole family living in one room. There was two people and I think、uh, three children, if my memory is right, living in one room. I thought this was rather strange. I didn't understand why.、Um, I like to keep good relations with people I'm working in an office, and therefore I gave him some tips for help. He said, after about three weeks, he came and saw me almost in tears, 
and said, I want to thank you so much for your help you've given. He said, we had to flee from Azerbaijan because of the war. And we, have no, we had nowhere to live. We have to live in this one room because we've got nowhere else to live and you've given us some money. And that was incredible. I, I saw pensioners in Russia after the disintegration of the social security system and the pension system standing on a street selling a single cigarette or trying to sell a single cigarette, not selling a pack of cigarettes, standing there trying to sell a single cigarette. But understand what this generation means. This is the generation, the pensioners at that time, who defeated fascism, who saved Europe from fascism. This is the generation of whom it should be the highest duty of the state to make sure that they can live their old age in comfort and dignity, etc. And instead, they're standing there trying to sell a single cigarette. People who were re very regular pensioners would cook a pie or a cake and stand on the street for hours in order to try to sell it. The family where I lived, right, there... I, move, I have a way of learning language, which is I, I like to move in a, in a family, because it's good. If you live, hire, don't live in a hotel, hire a room in a family, and then you, you have to speak the language and you learn it. When I moved into a family, both of the people died within one year, both the, the father and the mother, because there was no med medicine. They both died of cancer, there was no adequate medicine for it. That was what was the reality of seeing the disintegration of a socialist country. Let's look at the people who profited from this. And some people got very rich. They were completely rotten. I'll tell you what they told me in private, which they wouldn't say to you. Several people said to me, this was people getting rich, if old people can't adjust to the market, it's a good thing if they die. Not one person, several people said that. There were people who said, Again, not one, but two. It would have been better if Germany had won the war, because then capitalism would have been introduced more quickly. Can you imagine that? That's equivalent to somebody saying it would have been better if Japan had won the war against China. Right, okay. the pe this was the people who got rich out of this. I also saw the patriotic reaction of the Chinese people, of the Russian people about this. I have worked with a translator, and she said to me, she made a speech in Russian that people didn't understand, that I knew I understood, saying, every day I work with foreigners, and the more I work with foreigners, the more proud I am to be Russian. And the audience said, <laughs> and I had to keep a very straight lip to make sure that they didn't know that I understood what she'd said. Um, another friend who was, the people changed their minds and were betrayed, Somebody who had defended the White House with Yeltsin in August 1991, uh, she caused the scandal because when he died, she happened to be in London and she was at a Russian event and everybody was asked to stand up and she said, I'm not going to stand up. Why should I stand up for somebody who destroyed my country? That was the changes which took place at that time. Okay, these people foresaw nothing. I had a debate with the vice president of uh, Russia, or rather, he did a speech, I did a speech afterwards, and he demanded to reply to me, because he said the country's going to go very well, the economy is going to go very well, etc. I said, it's not, it's going to collapse. He foresaw nothing. I had a debate with President Yeltsin's economic advisor, who said, oh, companies will invest in Russia because we've translated the uh, works of Milton Friedman. <laughs> uh, I said, don't, you know, it's not a pick that no they won't. They'll invest in China because they make money. It, you know, they know that Deng Xiaoping is a communist. It's not a s secret. You don't have to have a spy in order to find out that Deng Xiaoping is a communist. What happened later? They've invested hundreds of billions of dollars in China and almost nothing in Russia. I said, NATO will advance to the borders of Russia. They said, you're crazy. The Americans have promised that NATO will not advance to the borders of Russia. We can see later who was right about that. Of course it is now, the situation is that NATO is right on the borders. What is crucial is that it was possible to foresee all this in advance, that is both the success of China and that with adopting socialism with Chinese characteristics, 
and the failure of Russia. How do we know this? Because I wrote an article that predicted in advance. In 1992, I wrote an article called Why the Economic Reform Will Succeed in China and Fail in Russia. The argument of that is totally self-evident what it was. It was, why was it possible to foresee the same success of China? Because people said to me at that time, why are you so, in this is in Russia, why are you so interested in China? This is 1992. At that time, China's economic reform was being successful, but it hadn't gone through the huge economic expansion, right? I said, because it corresponds to the correct positions in economic theory, in the economic theory of Marx, of basic economic theory. That will make China succeed. How was it possible to write this? It wasn't because I was in China. I had no contact with China. In, in, to my knowledge, I never met anybody from mainland China until the early 2000s. I met um, Hang Zhen, who was then the, the mayor of Shanghai, is now a member of the Standing Committee of the Politburo, because he had a meeting with the mayor of London. Right. I never met anybody. F 13 years after I'd written this article, I'd never even met anybody from mainland China. It was possible to predict this because what China was doing corresponded to the fundamental questions of economics. And as long as it continues to pursue that path, it will be successful. That, that's the fundamental thing. What happened in Russia was that the state sector of the economy was destroyed. That is, socialism was destroyed. And it was perfectly possible to predict that the economy would collapse. What's the result if we look at this now, how this shapes the debate in the West? The, the, the world has gone through two enormous experiences directly related to socialism, which give lessons and which shape the whole discussion in the West. One is the positive experience of the growth of China and China's socialism and economic characteristics and its success. And the other, the negative, is the decline of, uh, of Russia when it adopted capitalism instead of socialism. What is the balance sheet of all this? President Putin said, it's a pity, well, he didn't, no, he didn't say pity, he said, Russia should have learned from the experience of China. Very good. I applaud President Putin. The problem is 28 years too late. There's been a catastrophe since then. At that time, there were stupid people in Russia who said Russia had nothing to learn with, from China. At that time, the Russian economy and the Chinese economy were almost exactly the same size. Now China's economy is five times as large as the Russian economy. It turned out that the people of Russia had a very great deal to learn from China, and they're beginning to do that now. Now, many people in Russia describe China as the, as the eighth economic, or the eighth miracle of the world. But I, unfortunately, I find some people in China who say exactly the same stupid things that were said in Russia. <laughs> I have people, I have, I had a discussion with an employee of a Western, Chinese employee of a Western company, who said to me, uh, America has the most rapidly growing economy in the world. I said, this is just not true. <laughs> this is the data. China's economy grows three, three times as fast as the United States. He said, it's not worth discussing with you. This, <laughs> this was a Chinese person. I said, no, you can't discuss with me because you can't refute the facts. That's why you don't discuss with me. I know China media personalities who in private write that, it's, that the whole state enterprise system should be dismantled and privatized. They won't say it in public, uh, because that would be too controversial, but that's what they write in private, because they think that I'm a Westerner, therefore they say it to me, which they won't say to you. Mm -hmm. What would that produce? That would produce exactly the same catastrophe as in Russia. My greatest dread would be to see the same thing in China that happened in Russia. That is it. I don't want to see Chinese people go through the type of economic decline which they did, which Russia did, being told lies. Finally, I just want to relate this to the international discussion. And here again, I'm going to, I could, Eric and Zhang Weiwei have put it rather theoretically. I'll again speak from personal experiences. I was invited several times to Latin America um, to speak on the economy. I remember very vividly, I was in a discussion in Venezuela 
with what is now President Maduro. He was, he was not president at that time, he was the foreign minister. Um, I was with the, a Brazilian next to me who said, he, he whispered to me, he said, Baba, you, can, you can say China's very good, but please don't say it's socialist. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, <laughs> right. So I, of course, started my speech by saying, I am now going to talk about the successes of socialist China. <laughs> right. Now, six years later, I suddenly find that lots of my articles are translated into Portuguese and published in Brazil. I know this, this discussion is taking place because they want to learn from the successes of Brazil. Uh, something amazing is happening, which I know Eric was talking about, in the United States. All the polls show that the most popular politician in the United States is Bernie Sanders. Now, Bernie Sanders says, I'm a socialist. Well, this, we'll leave aside the discussion of how radical a socialist and if he is a socialist, but he says, I'm a socialist. And this is the poll show. He's the most popular politician in America. He's, that tens of millions of people say, See, yeah, socialism, socialism is a great guy. Right. You have to understand this. It's a hundred years since socialism was popular in the United States. The last person who got a vote, and if my memory is right, it was about 3%, was Eugene V. Deb. For a hundred years, you couldn't speak about socialism. Suddenly, the most popular politician in America is socialist. The polls show that young people in the United States prefer socialism to capitalism. It's true, older people don't, but young, young people do. Finally, therefore, what I just want to say about this. You can have a discussion. You, you have seen something good. You know, I know that the high-speed train and the cash, uh, cashless payments and the foreign holidays and all these types of things, that's good, right? Okay, That's the positive. I've also seen the disaster, the negative. What would happen if the socialist system in, Ch in China was abandoned? Because not as merely as a question of theory, I've seen it with my own eyes and lived through it. And if I had a, an hour and a half, I could tell you more and more terrible stories. And finally, that's the key question about this is on the question of the future of socialism. These are the two huge experiences of socialism which are going to affect the debate in the world. One is the negative consequences of the fall of socialism in the Soviet Union and the restoration of capitalism and the national catastrophe this led to. And the other is the success of socialism in China. And if I've had to speak on the negative, it's because there's two very good speakers who spoke on the positive. Thank you very much. Thank you.